What's up, y'all? Happy Monday morning for all of y'all that are catching this. As soon as it comes out, first thing every Monday, we've got it there for you. And uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to all of y'all that are listening to this podcast from all over the world. I I, I want to give thank you to or thanks to y'all first. Um, just because we make this stuff, this content for you guys, um, and worldwide, I just wanted to give a huge shout out last week. I was incorrect with the counts for, uh, our countries and how many cities listen to us, uh, worldwide. I was way off y'all. So all time right now, we have 74 different countries and territories worldwide, and as far as the cities across all of the world, <clears throat> okay, so all of the cities inside of all of those countries that are listening, we're in 1,058 cities across this globe. Um, so thank you to all of y'all that are listening throughout everywhere. Um, but we are going to recognize the top five cities across the world um that has been listening you guys over this past week squeezing their way right back into the top five y'all probably know who i'm gonna say um, but they are fighting each week to stay in the top listening cities throughout the whole world okay so shout out to portland oregon thank you so much um and this week um which or i'm sorry last week's um, Sydney, Australia was our number one and they're a number four this week. Cape Town, Western Cape, South Africa coming in at number three. All of my brothers and sisters down there in South Africa, thank you so much. Um, this one is new to the top five, which is Brisbane, Queensland, everybody. And then our top listening city throughout the entire world this week, give it up, number one is Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much, Seattle. All right, you guys, this week, our guest, man, one of my favorite people whenever I went to a lone boot camp to the alone casting there in New York, I walk through the doors there at the hotel that we're all staying at and everybody's getting in there from their, you know, everybody's pulling up in their, their ride back from the airport or their ride from the airport to where we're going to be, um, basically talking to all of the production people there with, um, with alone and everybody that, uh, contributes as far as the casting, the way they do their casting, um, the boot camp. I don't know if they still do the boot camp, but I, I think maybe, Season eight was the last year that they did the boot camp. But anyways, I walk through the door and there's these two girls and they're sitting there chatting and um, and there's a couple of guys over here chatting and there's just little groups and stuff of people and I walk in and just start, you know, introducing yourself to everybody, where you're from and, uh, you know, what do you do and this and that. And Callie Russell, just she caught my eye because she had elk ivory earrings in <clears throat> and uh she was wearing buckskins um you know just uh buckskin clothing that she had made and <laughs> you know i was just i was like oh my gosh this is definitely my kind of people right here um anyways our guest this week y'all is callie russell um, if you don't know who callie is she was a participant in season seven made it Man, 70 something days, um, you know, it, we don't get into any much alone stuff, but we talk about her lifestyle of the way she roams the country with her goats and the things that she does and participates in and some classes that she's been teaching. And it was so great. And uh, can't thank Callie enough. And I really do uh, appreciate her coming on. Um, it was, you know, luckily she was getting ready for a class. So she had service and was able to make contact with us and it was perfect. And, uh, I think it's, this is, you know, this is why we do this is because of these kind of conversations right here. And, 
I, I want to apologize to everybody because we did say that um, Luke from the Outdoor Boys was going to be this week. But you guys, I apologize. We had some technical difficulties. Um, and anyways, uh, <laughs> we are working through that. And uh, we just, uh, yeah, it, it will hopefully be next um, if, if nothing catastrophic happened um but you know to say the least we do have this luckily um and uh yeah it was so great to to get with Callie and I hope you guys enjoy this episode episode number 17 y'all Callie Russell Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to In the Bush podcast with Cole and Joel. Man, Joel. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This podcast guest right here, I've been looking forward to since you and I were in Texas and we were on our pig hunt and we decided to finally make this this podcast go. Callie, you 100%. were right at the top of our list um, to have on. So everybody... Joel, you want to introduce our good friend here? Callie Russell. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, the fellow participant on season seven of Alone, which no, which no one will ever forget. Um, no. What a wonderful performance. And I tell you what, uh, one of the human beings that Cole and I, I think we'd agree when we say that we feel honored to call you a friend. Absolutely. Uh <laughs> Joel, Cole, it's so good to finally be here, and you two are just incredible humans, and I'm so happy for all of us to get to hang out and chat today. Yeah. Well, thank you, but you're a more incredible human being. If that's even <laughs> incredible. Incredible. <laughs> you're you're a, the most incredible human being. I tell you, uh, there are. I have never met another Cali. Hey, Cole. No, <laughs> like, there's there is, yeah. No, there is no. You know how like people, you can almost categorize certain people. You'll meet someone and, you, and you'll be like, oh, he reminds me of like Peter because of his mannerisms and whatever it may be. Maybe f his physically, he looks, Kelly is Kelly. There's, there's no other people like Kelly. And I tell you who, for anyone who gets the opportunity to get to know this woman, you will be touched in the most wonderful way. Yeah. I knew it immediately so, whenever I walked in the hotel and I saw elk <laughs> ivories hanging off of this girl's ears. I was like, let's go. This right here is my kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly, I, I saw you in the airport because we actually took the same flight into New York for the Lone Boot Camp and you were wearing buckskins and you had the uh, clean canteen bottle on the outside of the pack. I'm like, ah, oh, she has to be going to boot camp but sure <laughs> we got there and took the the bus ride we got to to know each other in, pretty much immediately before we even got to got to the hotel so um yeah but you know kelly you have been to tanzania um with me i think three times right with the hudza yeah yeah three times yeah. and and you know on that bus ride when we first met it was the coolest thing because I felt like we kind of dropped in with each other right away. And I was just like, yep, these are, this is my kind of people. And cool. I remember, you know, we were, we were getting the ride from the airport to the hotel there for the alone boot camp. And I felt right there. I was like, well, who knows if this alone show is going to be like part of my path or part of my journey. They might not pick me for the show but I know I'm supposed to be here right now because I know I'm supposed to meet Joel and I know I'm supposed to go to Africa with him. I knew right then in that car ride. Wow. Interesting. That's wow. so yeah. cool. You never yeah. shared that with me, but but it was very clear to, to me, like, um, so that first time that you came to Tanzania, we had, uh, 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 with Jeremy too, right? Um, we had yeah. like a week or so before um, any of the participants arrived. And... If you remember that one night we had this, I think we had a little couple of mushrooms or something and we were just super chill. Yeah. 
we went and sat up on that rock. I think it was that night. And there was the lion rock, right? Yes, the lion rock, because that was the cave where there used to be a, a pride of lions living. And we went and sat up on that rock. And there was this distinct energy that was just flowing through my body so intensely, just telling me that we were all meant to be there right at that moment. Like it was absolutely perfect. It was almost like the landscape was just praising and welcoming us and wanting us to be there. But um, I, I just also knew at that point that you were meant to be there. 100%. I think that um, I, I, I know with certainty that my life um, involved with the Hadza is is sort of preordained and I've had many signs, but absolutely it's exactly the same for you. Not only did I get that sense, but the way, the dynamic, the way that you um, interacted with the Hadza, but more, more importantly, the way that the Hadza responded to you, I mean, your name is renowned through Hudson land. I mean, mine too, but you know, Cullen, not Kelly, Cullen, Cullen is known by almost all the Hudza in Hudson land for good reason. Cause they have been touched just like all of us have by you. So it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know. I never told you that, but I just knew because at that time, you know, we didn't know if how things were going to go, if we'd get picked for the show or not. And, you know, I was just sort of following the path and I just knew I was like, oh, because I, I always I've always wanted to go to Africa and I've always wanted to spend time with the Huds. Well, not always, but I guess since I knew they existed. Yeah. And when I met you, I was just like, oh, I know. I know why I'm here. You know, who knows if this shows a, a go or not, but I know why I'm here right now. So it was really, really wow. cool. And it just I'm yeah, it's so neat how it's sort of evolved over the years you know and like deepened so it's yeah. wonderful how life works that way i remember we were sitting around the fire on that intro to hunting course call and we were all kind of uh, uh giving gratitude right and that night you said i'm grateful for the unknown and you know those words that you said always stick out in my mind because the unknown is what makes life an adventure and it's yeah. what makes it so exciting yeah and uh you know well, we're all venture well, together but man there's intertwined something yeah there's so much of this life that you know in us being human beings we want to control so much and i've really man it seems like even just the past like six or eight months i've really learned that the more you let go of what you're trying to control and just let things freaking happen because you you were out out of control a hundred percent you you just have to understand that yeah. and then the things will come like start to kind of flow for you um and dude i've really been you know connecting into um welcoming the unknown and the future of what i can't control and just you know that's the way i let hunts unfold even right it's just you yeah. you sometimes you do what the path tells you to do you read the right signs and stuff and you you choose your path that way but as far as what comes you know at you from whatever angle it is uh it's just out of your control and you have to you have to deal with it as they come you know it's kind of kind of like the weather oh, while we're out there and that that is a great place to start because with this podcast because Kelly you have this incredible ability to just flow it's like you know there's um I always resonate with uh, Tom Brown Jr's philosophy with you know the, from Stalking Wolf the energy that flows through all things and to me like who creator is who our God is is that energy that flows through all things and being able to just tap into it and then uh, just uh, um, I guess, release and submit to that. And you are like the prime example of that. You you don't like live life. You just flow through life. <laughs> you have this incredible ability to just like water, just mold yourself around things and just accept them for the way that they are. And not just things as far as like uh, experiences or instances that, that happened in life, but with people, you're so accepting with other people and and the most unjudgmental person, one of the un most unjudgmental people I've ever met. Where do you, how do you get, how do you have that when so few people <laughs> do? Well, <laughs> you know, 
I don't really know, but I think that life is just taught me to be that way. Life, life is the ultimate teacher, you know? And I think, you know, for me, which we've, we've talked about this. So, you know, um, when I was seven years old, I, my uh, little brother died, you know, in a car accident that I was in and we were really close. We were, we were like soulmates, you know, our, I felt like our souls were really intertwined. Um, him and I, we were only 18 months apart. So we were really close in age and we just were very close. And when he died, it, you know, was, a, a, had a huge impact on me. I feel like a, a piece of my, um, like a piece of my soul kind of like went with them, you know, or I don't think it did go with them. I think we're all, it's all connected. And it's like, we're, I'm still connected with him in a way. But at, at that time when I lost him, when he died, it just felt, you know, it was, it was sort of shattering for me. And so I think life really started teaching me at this young age that I'm, I'm not in control. Everything that, you know, Cole just said that we're, we're not it. And we, we want to be in control and we want to, try to do everything we can to sort of gather some ground under us and have a foundation and have, um, protection and, um, you know, be able to predict things. But the thing is, we just, there's really nothing we can do about it. We have, we have no control and we can't predict things. And I think that lesson came to me pretty early on in life when my little brother died and it sort of put my whole idea about life, um, on its, you know, it flipped it upside down because there was this expectation that me and my brother are going to grow up and, you know, live our lives as adults and, you know, be grandparents or whatever it was. And I, you know, never expected for him to die. Um, and sorry, there's a goat pushing. This is obsidian. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, uh, I don't want to, oh man, I, I'm so desperately want to ask you. So, so please get back to your story, but that goat is up in your face. It, it, it completely reminding me of a dog. That goat clearly loves you. Yeah. Like, yeah, he, he is all about getting affection right now. Yes. The, yes. The, the, these goats, they, they are a lot more like dogs. We're really close and they love affection and love and snuggling and yeah right now obsidian just he likes to put his head you know right by my face and yeah, push yeah. his face on my face and get <laughs> get his chin scratched and okay. once they're d- done eating they'll all kind of lay down probably lay down around me and he's he's this goat is trained to be a backrest oh he's going down right he's all he's right pawing. we got to uh we're don't gonna, worry, we're, we're gonna, I won't get, get sidetracked. We're going to talk goats here for sure, but um, I, I definitely don't want to be distracted. Um, I want to, I want you to finish it, your thought if you if you still wanted to add to anything to that story, which which is very touching. Absolutely, I just you know couldn't ignore. <laughs> it's like, totally, right there. He's like, yeah, I got I got you, sister. You know, I got you. <laughs> But he just laid down and I'm leaning on him now, which, you know, is part of their training. Backrest back uh, yeah. training is very important. <laughs> it, <laughs> back warmer, warmer and rest. Um, but anyway, with with Devin, that was that's my brother's name. Losing him at that young age, just it was it was so clear that it doesn't it doesn't matter what I want to have happen in life. Life is just happening. So, and, you know, then the journey kind of continues with, you know, feeling it's like you either want to cling or resist to so much and resist things that we don't like and try to sort of manipulate the whole world and to be some, be something that we want, but it's just like things are happening and they're completely out of our control. And so I just realized, um, that, you know, I was causing myself a lot of suffering, you know, wanting things to be different, wanting Devin to still be alive, but there was no amount of wanting that, that I could do to bring him back. Yeah. And what, what, what I could do was surrender to the reality of life and what is life and death, the reality of both and actually just be with what is and I, so I think that that lesson just, it hit me so hard at a young age. And of course I didn't have any of those words at that time, 
those words came with, you know, my adult understanding of kind of what was happening. And I think from there on, I just made this choice to, to actually live, to live life and go with it and, and also not let it, um, slip by either because I also realized just how precious it is. It's so precious and we don't, we don't know how long we're going to get or anybody around us. And so just wanting to every moment as much as possible, be present and soak it up. And, and, and I think the best way to honor life and to honor being alive is actually honoring what actually is instead of wanting it to be something else. Like, Oh, I wish it was like this, or I wish it was like that, or I'll be happy and enjoy myself once I fill in the blank. It's like, no, like, it's perfect right now. Just enjoy it right now. We're living, we're here, we're alive. And so that, I think that kind of attitude has just sort of affected my life choices, uh, you know, going through and, and also, yeah, compassion for other people too. And just, yeah, I, I, I think I just love people even, even in all of our imperfection, you know, because we're just kind of these messy, imperfect people and it's beautiful. And I think I just feel that, you know, so. Yeah. I I love that you are able to not only possess wisdom like that, but you're able to actually um, implement what is that in the background? So a red wing blackbird is chasing a blue heron right now. <laughs> chasing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that got the heron got too close to the nest. The, the, yeah, and the heron's like. Ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just They're so the, funny when they get upset. <laughs> so yeah. for the listeners, uh, uh, you know, hold on, be patient. We will get there. But Kelly is sitting outdoors with a bunch of goats. And like I said, we'll get there. We'll, we'll describe the whole situation <laughs> and how she lives and a lot of good. Stay tuned. Yeah, we but, are going to um, dive into I, that. We're going to dive into that. Um, but you are outdoors right now. So, um, so Kelly, uh, what I was going to say is that the, the fact, um, the point I was trying to make, I think, is the is the fact that you're not not only do you have that wisdom, but you are able to actually implement it. And I find that that's pretty hard, eh, Cole? Wouldn't you agree? Like, if you have like these realizations through a psilocybin ceremony or something, the hardest thing to do, as our friend Sky says, the real ceremony is in life, mm. is to go and implement these things in life day after day and not fall back upon the bad habits or being a judgmental person and like how do you just how do you consistently do that yeah because i think I'm, just me I'm, how do i do it I'm, or... hold on i gotta confess this because i'm bad about that too man and it's so weird because you're right like in ceremony or whenever we we have a sit down and we're going through this and profound you know information or download that we're getting and everything's supposed to be about love and then as soon as i get in my truck and i'm in traffic i'm like you mother you know <laughs> <laughs> you know it just maybe because uh, we're we, we're in that situation um but i also like you said a second ago callie that I'm bad about doing this too is one day I'm going to move to the mountains because I live in Texas and I'm, I'm forced to be here because, um, you know, I want my kids to finish school and stuff, but I'm always dreaming about what I'm going to be as far as climate and where I want to live ge geography well, when really I should be thankful and loving what I have right now. And, you know, just, love the 110 degrees and the 100 percent humidity rather than you know use yeah, it as an know. excuse that's, that's pushing <laughs> dude that's I, but pushing. but really it's the truth <laughs> because i can't control it right now i'm really i gotta kind of flow through this because it's just a time yeah. in my life when i i do because i also live you know i don't have a 401k or any plans for the future i live my life you know, as, as random and as rambunctious as I can, because I want to experience as much as I possibly can. If I work an eight hour day, I got to spend the next four or five hours doing something really cool to offset, you know, my work that I did that day to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so, 
I, yeah, like for real, it, it, it's because <laughs> it's not what I want to be doing, but I know I have to, to be able to provide for my family and stuff like that, you know? Um, so it's, yeah. Thank you for that little message. Yeah. Kelly, do you think, do you think you're okay? So we're going to have to, we're going to have to start filling in the listeners here a little bit. So you live a life of constant connection with the outdoors. Um, so, so my question is, can you paint the picture how, wh where you live, how you currently live? And if you think that living that way is what enhances your ability to, to have gratitude for others and life. And do you think that that plays a big part in it? It, it probably does because you know, life and nature is such a big teacher. And, you know, you, and it is like right now there's like mosquitoes, you know, sort of swarming around and, and it, it's so easy to be like, Oh gosh, I, I just, you know, if there wasn't mosquitoes, then I would be enjoying my day. And it's yeah. like, well, mm -hmm. actually I get to choose if I choose enjoy my day. That is up to me. That's my choice. And, if I want to, I can just spend the day being mad about mosquitoes or I can spend the day being mad that, you know, whatever it dumped rain and the goats destroyed their tarp and now they're soaking wet and I'm worried about them. And so I'm out in the rain having to reset up their tarp, the, a new tarp that because they did, ripped up their other one and I can get all mad about it and upset or I can just still choose to enjoy the day and it's like wow is you know isn't it cool that the mosquitoes are here and they're actually coming and taking a little bit of my blood and then feeding the birds so i'm like actually feeding the birds and the bats and the swallows like the swallows i'm like watching the swallows come and grab the mosquitoes and feed them to their babies i'm like whoa baby swallows are eating my blood right now that is pretty cool that's so I, that awesome. is pretty cool. I never looked at it that way. That's look at that. That's, That's the ultimate so definition of positivity. Yeah. Right. And so I think being just kind of in our, you know, our home landscape, which is just, you know, integrated with the trees and the bugs and the dirt and the, 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 everything, the muck in the water, it's, it, it's easier to, to kind of see that and also maybe flip the perspective too. And just like, wow, I can just spend my, my day being mad about how annoying the mosquitoes are, or I can just awaken to the fact that this is a freaking cool life right now. And my, literally my blood is being fed to little baby swallows. And I get to watch that happening right now. Like, how cool is that? It's so cool. Like, <laughs> you know, and everything, I feel like everything's like that, whatever, you know, every, you know, we just, it's just a, it's just a matter of a choice, you know? And, and I had a really big moment of realization like that, um, when I was on alone too, which we can talk about later, but I, I do feel like being outside really helps. It, it just, it helps put things into perspective, I think. Yeah. Mm hmm it definitely does. But you're living closer to the land than most. I mean, you're spending most of your year living. Is it, are you still living in like a wall tent or did you build a tiny, like a small cabin? Well, so I do have a tiny cabin, which I call my shome sure. because it is a shed that I turned into a home. It's 10 by 16 on the outside. So a little smaller on the inside. And I do, I, so I have that and it's got a wood stove in it. But the thing is, is I'm hardly ever there. I think last, like in 2024, I think I probably spent total maybe four or five weeks there or something. Um, and this is up and, in Montana on this rural land that, which is, which is owned by your parents, this rural land that you're, that you pretty much is your base, right? Yeah, that's right. It's up. Um, yeah, it's in Northwest Montana. It's, it's family land, um, that what, you know, was my grandparents and it's kind of, yeah, like family, like really deep, um, family roots, but it's raw. Um, yeah, raw, like, un or sorry, I was gonna say unforested. <laughs> it's forested, undeveloped, forested land. Cool. And, um, yeah. And so my little shomes up there, but I'm not there that much, but it is sort of a, it's a base camp right now. We're not there. Um, and you know, all winter I was down in the Southwest with the goats and stuff, but it is, it's super nice to have that base. And I really love 
knowing that there's a whatever a spot I can leave a few things because for many years I I had no <clears throat> I didn't really have that as a base and I didn't you know have a place to kind of stash stuff so I do appreciate having that little spot to stash things oh yes obsidian's re- readjusting here my backrest <laughs> had to turn around so, so and, what took you what took you down like what's keeping you away for most of the year now is it the gatherings is it teaching is it just to get to a warmer just some warmer weather or Right. Well, so I guess with to the shome real quick, um, when I am up at the shome, it is really nice to have in the winter time to be up there. And um, last winter, and I I do different things, different winters. Some winters I stay, you know, I've stayed up at the shome for the whole winter, but usually I don't. Last year I left in January. So we were getting it was literally negative 40. Mm-hmm. It was so cold. It was reminding me of alone <clears throat> and the goats, you know, they're really tough, but that that's also really, really rough. And it's not like there's electricity to where I could run a heater for them or anything like that. So they're just staying warm with their own, you know, I do the best to kind of make, um, they have all these like little pallet, pallet shelters and stuff like that. But anyway, um, anyways, uh, we left, in January and headed down to the Southwest and we're down there up until, you know, early June. And anyway, so with I, what keeps me away from there is just life because there's other things. Yeah. There's gatherings to go to, but also, you know, beautiful wilderness to get into. And then also teaching classes because that spot's not really conducive for teaching courses um, because of the access to Mm. it. Yeah. Um, so I, where I teach is other places. And so that's like where we're here now is a place that, um, is great for teaching classes. Cause you can get, you know, the access and there's water and all kinds okay. of nice things. And, yeah. and you have, you're, you're just like in a wall tent there. So yeah. It's a little bell. It's a bell tent, which I can, well, I guess it doesn't matter cause we're not doing the video, but yeah, there's, it's just over there, a little, little bell tent. Cool. And so the, uh, the goats, um, the, the, there's clearly just such a passion from you towards these goats and, uh, you, you have definitely, you're, you're raising these goats mm-hmm. in a lot more of an ancestral or traditional way in the sense, um, they're kind of like the, 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 the toga, right? You, you free, you free range them, you wild graze them, right? So, so can you explain how... How did you, what made you decide to get goats? Like what was that, that journey like? And, um, and then just explain how you sort of raise them slash interact with them and on your day to day life. Yeah. So, oh, and I realized I said the year, whatever year wrong, I was referring to 2023. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't... Very important. What year, what, what year are we in? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> We're like the like the Hadza arguing about what, what year it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, arguing Hadza, uh, the Hadza arguing about how old they are. Cause they don't count yeah. birthdays or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Funny. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So I've got, I, um, have a, a herd of Alpine goats. They're milk goats and pack goats. And I, yeah, I do. I raise them really, cl- you know, it is different, you know, it's not like, okay, the farm, the goats are in their fence and the the, the goats have their area The humans have their area. We have our own separate lives and we interact, you know, a few times a day for, you know, feeding or whatever. It's kind of my life is completely integrated into the goat's lives. I, I think they view me as part of the herd. Well, they do because if I try to leave them, if I leave them in a fence somewhere and go away, they all yell, you know, they're like, ah, (laughs) <laughs> like all yelling at me they're like where the hell do you think you're going you're part of this herd um so yeah it is it is more kind of i think how yeah people and the datoga have their animals and people throughout like most of the world you know your animals are your life force they're what gives you your food and everything you need and so you keep them close and you always have someone with them because they're so valuable and so precious that you, you know, uh, other people throughout the world, there's always someone with the animals and the animals are kind of right up in the living space. You know how the Dictoga have their villages. It's yeah. the, they have their thorn walls and then the houses in the middle and all the animals are inside the walls with them. And yep. yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And right around their houses and stuff, because it's like, of course, they're so important. You want to have them nice and close and integrated into your life. And so these guys are like that too. They do eat, they eat, um, like right now they're eating a hundred percent wild food. And most of the year they eat a hundred percent wild food, except for when we're, if we do stay the winter in Montana, then they are getting hay, um, to supplement. But we, even in the winter, we go out walking and they eat what they can. They love conifers and the dug fur needles and, you know, spruce tips and all that. I mean, is there, is, have you seen anything that grows out of the ground that those goats will not eat? Yeah. Well, not that they, so they actually are really selective. It's interesting because they do have this reputation of, oh, goats will eat anything, even a tin can. The thing is, is if they can, they can survive off really low quality forage. But they, if they have the option, they choose the best stuff and they're very picky. Their lips are very dexterous. So they can actually be more selective than uh, cows, for example. And they go and they go pick off the best stuff. Like right now they're eating all the, uh, the seed heads off of the orchard grass. You know, they're like going and picking those tips off instead of eating all of the grass. And they like to climb up and eat the cottonwood leaves and the birch leaves and that kind of thing. So they're very selective. And if they eat all the good stuff, then of course they'll eat other, they'll eat whatever they need to, but they are actually very selective and choosy and they choose different plants at different times of year based on what the plant's doing and, you know, what, where the good stuff is, you know, so it's really interesting watching how selective they actually are. It's incredible. Like they are no doubt, like people say, it's a dog's life. Well, it's a goat's life. I mean, those those goats are living their best life with you, no doubt. They're healthy looking, um, really attractive looking goats, um, I must say. And what's most touching, which I, which I sort of mentioned earlier, was they clearly are very affectionate with you. And I would agree from what I've seen through your videos that you post on Instagram and what you've describe to me that those goats are you you're one of the group for sure they look at you as like mama you know so it's actually it's not like having a dog or like having children right these are your little kids yes they're my little and big kids yes <laughs> how many, Which, how many do you have? uh right now i have 11 okay nice is mm-hmm. that uh is that like the upper end of what you want to handle or is that a good number well ideally i'd have a few less ideally i'd have around eight um but i i ideally i'd have less but i do struggle with keeping my number um where i want it because i lo- i fall in love with all of them last summer i had 16 goats and i um a few of them went to go live with friends and it's just i still think about them all the time you know and check in on them it's like their family you know so it's hard for me to to downsize but it, it you know it's it's good though with the way we live since i am so mobile and we load up in the trailer and we go different places i can't have two well i could but it it makes sense to have a smaller herd but like any like like having kids right there is mm-hmm. a um a dependence on you it's a, it's a definite responsibility because you you do have to make sure that they feed enough each day and how how many hours are you sort of walking them each day to graze them <laughs> um sometimes like 6 hours <laughs> okay that's cool you're, it's, you're, you're more, yeah you're it's more it's more like being a shepherd you know, it's like you're doing what basically the young Maasai boys do with their cattle, you know, is they're just their full time job is to walk their cattle around and graze them and of course protect them from predators every day. That's their job. And so it's yes. like I'm job. Essentially I am a young Maasai boy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but yeah. It, it is it is true though. And I always think about that, especially go, you know, going to Tanzania with you and stuff. I'm like, you know, I, I I'm really doing the work of children here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Because every, you know, in mo- in a lot of cultures, it is the younger people that do it. But I am. I'm out with them, and they like to eat between. It's like two or three hours in the morning and two or three hours in the evening, where they're out eating, and then in that in between zone, the middle of the day is kind of like when they're relaxing and digesting, and that's my moment to try to do things. Um, 
without them, but a lot of days I'm still just with most of the days I'm still with them, you know, I'm with them all the time really. So I, yeah, it's basically kind of like how people herded back in the day or if you're in Tanzania still. Yeah. Well, so, so unlike having kids, I mean, you, uh, sorry, Cole, you go ahead. Yeah. I was just curious. So at any point, are you working the goats, Kelly? Or do you, um, maybe like, do you ever pack with them for people's trips or, um, I know that we've talked about your elk hunting, um, uh, helping out a guide, maybe pack some meat out into some, out of some nasty places and stuff. So I'd be curious what that looks like if, um, cause I'm sure when they get their little saddles or whatever they have on, they know it's time to go to work, huh? Yeah. Yeah. They love it. And the boys are the ones that carry the the big weight and like who's laying behind me obsidian he's a he's a big boy and they love to work they get the when i get the saddles out they wag their tails oh, yeah. and i gotta choose who i whoever gets the saddle on first is happy and whoever has to wait in line they get kind of like angsty and go like headbutt the one that gets the saddle because they're kind of <laughs> jealous or like oh you know and so the i gotta put the saddle on the alpha first otherwise he'll get i won't even be able to saddle up the other boys because he's mad that they're getting the saddle on first and like not leaving me alone to let to saddle up the other boys so they love it they love to work they actually do the boys do better when they work because they have all this energy and it, it's a way for them to you know have an energy outlet um uh and uh Anyway, so I do pack them quite a bit all winter, basically all winter and spring when I was down in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, we were packing around. So the boys were getting loaded up and, and packed and the girls can pack too, but they're making milk. So I'd rather their calories go to making milk than to carrying stuff, but I'll put some soft packs on them and they might carry, you know, some like sweaters or something kind of, kind of light, you know, how much weight can you load them up with? They can carry 25% to 30% of their body weight. And so these, the, the full grown weathers, the, the males, uh, they can, uh, they can carry 50 pounds wow. and it doesn't really, they don't seem to bat an eye at it. That's great. Wow. wow. And yeah. Do you but, see yeah. with that kind the of weight, weathers? with that kind of weight on them, Callie, do you, are they still playful and stuff? Are they still trying to climb up on stuff and do ridiculous things like goats do? Or they... Yeah, they do. And sometimes it's a little <laughs> dangerous. I'm like, you guys, like, especially when we first start later in the day, they kind of just, they're like, okay, we're just walking, yeah. you know, but when we first get going, they'll, <laughs> the other one time, uh, just on this last trip, Obsidian, he was all excited and he had his full weight on him and he spun around and did this like super spin. I don't know. He spun like two or three <laughs> times or something. And he like the, and he flung the, like the weight of the pack around and it, and it, um, it like, you know, got all loose and kind of like swung under him. And I had to go and like re put, put the pack on him again. Cause he was being crazy. And they do that, especially on downhills, they get, they go nuts for a downhill. And <laughs> if I'm with other people, I'm like, you guys just get out of the way and let them go because they love to, they like to run sideways downhills and like <laughs> really? their heads. They're like, yeah, we're partying. That's yeah, awesome. It's crazy. <laughs> really um, personality, no doubt about it. And Joel, you were asking about the, I think me calling them weathers. Yeah. So, I haven't heard that before. Yeah. A weather is basically the equivalent of, is a gelding horse. Um, so it's a, a castrated male. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And I, ha yeah, I have had uncastrated males in the herd many times, but they, um, it's a whole nother complicated oh. situation. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> Have you um have you run into predator issues when you're out there roaming with the goats? Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us, yeah, tell, I us have... tell us of one story that maybe stands out the most. Well, there I have a lot of exciting stories, but oh, of course, I mean tell. goats are in are in yeah. <laughs> Goats are very interesting, you know, for predators and some, you know, they have big horns and they're in a herd. So I think a lot of times, you know, the predators kind of think twice and, and if they're with people and that kind of thing, but I have had some pretty cool encounters. And one time 
we were camped. We had been in this camp for a while because the goats had their babies. So we were essentially posted up at a kidding camp in the wilderness to let the the moms have their babies. And we were like waiting for the babies to get old enough to where we could hike and move camp again. Where was that? Was that in Montana? It was in Arizona, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In a wilderness area out there. And uh, so we, anyway, anytime you're in a place for longer, I think the risk goes up for having an interaction with um, a hungry, a hungry, you know, bear, wolf or anybody. And so, yeah, we were kind of there for a while. The mamas had their babies and a mountain lion came into camp Mm. and grabbed one of the moms and she dragged her out of camp um, by her neck, you know, and I was always on alert. I always slept with one ear open you know um and i still do i feel like i always sleep with an ear or an eye open uh because i i'm like on mom mode protecting the goats and so i i heard it i heard something and i just knew my my being knew that there was something up and so i went out and i saw um yeah mountain lion had one of the goats by the neck and i was actually able to scare the mountain lion off of the goat and save the goat the goat survived girl <laughs> wow yeah man yeah. Uh, are you are you armed at all when you're out there like a, with a firearm or no um it just sometimes i am sometimes i'm not um yeah. i kind of go back and forth about like carrying a firearm you know i was there's always always got a, a staff or you know, sometimes I walk with my bow, um, Hadza style walking around with a bow and stuff. Yeah. But, and the, and at that time I did have a firearm, um, with me and on some trips I've taken firearms, but a lot of trips I don't take firearms. I feel like there's, I don't know, there's something about like the energetics of being out there and being vulnerable that I kind of like and so like all these last trips I just did this year I didn't I I um didn't have a a firearm with me at all but that at in that story I did I had a little 22 pistol um that was actually my grandpa's that he um that he gave to my dad and then my dad gave to me so it's kind of a special special gun but you you didn't have to use it though you managed you managed to scare him off without actually using the firearm well, I, in that situation, I, um, the firearm was shot off as kind of like an alarm, like a sound, basically a scary yeah. sound, yeah. but, um, the mountain line was not shot because yeah. I wasn't trying, you know, I don't really want to be like in conflict. She's just a mom trying to feed yeah. her babies, you know? So I'm not trying to, you know, kill her or be in conflict with the wild like that, you know, we're just another piece kind of fitting into it. Um, And, but I, but I, I don't want to kill that mountain lion mom. I'm assuming she was a mom, uh, because the time of year and everything, I I feel like she was trying to feed her babies, but I'm a mom and I'm going to protect my own. So (laughs) it was this really cool, like energetic, like mom versus, it was just like, I'm going to protect my babies. I'm (laughs) protecting my babies, you know, and neither of us wanted to back down, but eventually she did back down. Wow. Yeah, that's great. You know, Kelly, I, I just got to add something there. Like um, what you say about ch- not choosing to carry firearms completely resonates with me. Um, I know mm-hmm. that a lot of people think I'm a little nuts because all of the venturing that I do out in the wilderness areas here, I've never once carried a firearm. I don't carry firearms. Um, even when I know I'm in thick bear country, even when I've been up in Alaska, like in grizzly country, I don't carry firearms. And um I, you nailed it. Like, that's exactly the way I feel. I feel like I cannot completely connect energetically with the landscape, which means the animals and everything that lives on it, everything that's part of it. If I feel like it's almost like carrying a gun is inviting the energetic pull of 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 a predator or something harmful where i'm gonna consider using the gun and you know i've never i've had mountain lion like outside of my shelter two feet from where i'm sleeping i've had bears sniffing my tent i've had i've had some some close encounters but never have i felt in danger because i've been able to sort of 
connect with the situation in a way that I can understand what's going on. I can read the energetic uh, sort of energy coming off of the animal and it's never been aggressive or anything. Not to say that I'm going to not one day have a really bad uh, exchange with an animal that is very aggressive and is looking at me like food, but I feel like if I don't put that energy out there and if I walk around the landscape very aware and connected with the surroundings, a firearm is almost never needed. If you are aware and observant, would you agree with that? That you. That's that's how I feel. And I've you know, I've carried guns in the past, mostly because a cultural sort of conditioning. People are like, oh, you're a single female in the wild. You have to carry a firearm. Or you're just, you know, out there with your goats, you have to have a firearm to protect your animals. Or, you know, there's a lot of like, you have to carry a gun because there's bears. And so there has been many times where I have carried a gun. But the more that I did, I was like, I, I, I felt that same thing, Joel. I was like, I feel like by having a gun, I'm actually inviting this, um, yeah, inviting conflict. And I'm sort of telling... Yeah telling the other animals out there that I'm, you you know, that I'm sort of a threat and I'm there to, it's like, you know what it is? It's telling them that I'm scared of them. Mm. Yes. And it's saying, Hey, I'm scared of you. And so I have to have all my defenses up to, to, you know, to, I've got to be puffed up and protect myself. But if I don't have a gun, I feel like I can just connect with the landscape and with the animals and say, Hey, you know, maybe I am scared, but there's been, this is kind of a a deeper conversation about my sort of journey with being fearful of wild animals, which I'm not anymore. And, um, so I'm sorry, there's some air traffic. I hope that's not picking up on the sound right now. No, it's not bad. No, no, it's not. Oh, good. So, so Um, am I crazy? Yeah. Sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, Kelly. So I'm curious because I don't, I don't carry a pistol, whenever we're in the wilderness or I'm on hunts, but I carry a pistol daily in my modern life and around people. Um, so I, I oh, don't, yeah. I, <laughs> that makes sense. I don't carry uh, a gun for the things that I think might attack me other than the two legged weirdos like Gary coming up drunk from his campsite or something like that's the only reason yeah. I, I carry a pistol. Um, I, I'm not concerned. Totally. I'm not concerned with the animals. I'm more concerned about weirdos and, <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, so absolutely. When people are like, what, you know, what's the thing you're scared the most of in the wild? It's like, well, probably accidentally walking up on a meth head. You know? Yes. Like, <laughs> Like, and or, you know, or, I mean, not even to judge judge um, people that use meth too, because I mean, I've been, I have like a lot of family members that have you, you know, that yeah. use meth and stuff, and uh, spent a lot of time around that. But it's like, you know, someone that's using or is really unpredictable, and I'm like that. My my concern is people, unpredictable people, um, especially people that are like, yeah, have some substance in them that they're they're more unpredictable or more aggressive, and so. Yeah, that I think that that's a, <laughs> that's definitely more of a reason than the the animals for sure. Yeah, yeah, I I love this topic, and I know that uh, you know it might come across as all like hippie, and but there I, I don't I just I know what works for me, and I know that there's probably a lot of hunters that may listen to this and be like, man, these fucking idiots, listen to them talking about this. When you got aggressive <laughs> grizzly staring in your face, you're going to be praying for a gun. And I don't disagree with that, but there's, I, it's so hard to put in words, but I feel like you, like maybe you nailed it when you said that like there's a, it's, it's almost like a fear, right? If you have the gun, you're stepping into that natural area, wanting to engage with it, but in a way of fear. And I don't want to walk into any landscape in fear. I want to walk into it with absolute comfort and reverence for that landscape. And um, the gun just kind of distracts me from doing that. So, yeah, Not that, you know, I love guns, but I just I don't really like carrying them on me all the time. Yeah, that's how I feel. I just I got annoyed. I'm like, I don't want this big old thing on my <laughs> hip all the time, yeah. you know, and. And it is, it's, it is hard to put into words, Joel. And I feel like, yeah, it is sort of, I think many people 
will kind of be like, what the heck? Like if you're in Alaska and grizzly country, you have to have like a big firearm, you know, or, or in polar bear country or, you know, there's, and you know, who there's places that probably, you know, maybe even in Africa too. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, in lion country and stuff that people that carry and we all have our own experiences and some places it probably does make sense. But for my own personal experience, I've just felt like it's kind of ties back to what you were saying in the beginning, Joel of, or Cole of the, um, releasing this idea of control Mm. and actually letting, letting go. Um, because it is this thing of, of also accepting like, I could die. Yeah. And, and actually having peace with that. And I think a lot of people would be like, well, that's stupid. Like protect your life at all costs, carry a giant firearm. But I think that there's something about being in a landscape and actually having that peace and um, understanding and acceptance of that. I'm actually a part of this life cycle and I will die and I could die and I could be eaten by an animal and I won't and I'm not as strong as that animal who's trying to eat me. like I'm part of like the predator prey cycle. And there's something about I agree, Joel, it's very hard to put it into words, but there's something about being in the landscape with this acceptance and not coming at it with like, I must, um, I don't know, like I must protect myself at all costs. I don't know. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to put it into words, but I, yeah, don't judge people who carry firearms for whatever reason. There's many good reasons to carry them. But for my personal experience, I've found, I like how I'm, connecting and interacting with the landscape when I don't have a firearm. That's all. Yeah. And I'm just going to throw this out there too, because this is something I can't deny because I feel it, um, even though it might sound super wacky. Um, But honestly, I feel like when you go out there, there isn't a certain element of just trust. I just go out there trusting. I like, I know that if I go out there with reverence for the landscape, I trust that the landscape and the energy that flows through all things is going to look out for me. And I, that really sounds wacky, but I'm telling you, it has served me well. So, well, and there's also... Joel, I feel like that's the perfect... Go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> that I just feel like that's the perfect... That's exactly what I'm f- saying or, or connecting. I feel that too, because... And it, I feel like if I am trying to insulate myself and protect myself with all these things, all this gear, all these weapons. I'm not just trusting. I'm not just going out there with this trust. And I think you can have stuff with you and still be in that trusting mindset. But for me, it's so much easier to drop into this deep state of sort of surrender and trust when I am just out there. Like I'm just with myself. I'm not trying to insulate and protect myself with all my human um yes you know stuff things i uh obviously very spiritual i know you are too kelly and of course Mm -hmm. colin and i just know that a a very very strong spiritual connection for me the foundation is the natural world and i know that when i engage the deeper i engage with it uh the better my life is And so I would be going against my spiritual beliefs and my intuition, everything inside of me by going out into the wilderness with fear. Like I know that that is the wrong thing to do. So I I have accepted that a wolf could eat me, a bear could rip my face open, a cougar could break my skull. I accept that. I, 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 I accept that. That's fine. That's the chance I'm willing to take when I engage with the outdoors. You know what? The fact that that is a possibility even though it's very unlikely, it makes it more real and I feel more alive when I'm out there. Well, absolutely. You know why? Because when we're like that, we have more skin in the game. It's like yeah. we have more skin in the game. So we're actually experiencing the depth of life that we couldn't experience if we didn't have that skin in the game. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, 100%. And there's also an understanding of ways to move through the country and things to do to keep yourself from being in those situations, right? There might be certain Fantastic. times 
example. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. If you don't understand, like you can just get those feelings sometimes, right? Without there being anything around you, you just have that sixth sense of I'm not in a good position here or I'm putting myself at risk. So I need to be either move through this area quicker or I need to avoid this area because of what, you know, whatever. So I think that has probably a lot to do with it. Um, you're going to move through the country a little bit different whenever you're right behind fresh grizz tracks or, or fresh grizz poop or whatever you're, you're, you're then going to change the way you're, you're going through, right? It's not going to be the same as if you're walking a riverbank down here in Texas. Um, you know, you're going to be looking down on the ground and looking for the threat or, or moving through the area in a much different way. Um, yeah. When you, when you're walking through the landscape with the eyes of a tracker, meaning you know track like a hunter um you you are constantly looking for signs from the landscape you're constantly observing the ground the trees the terrain features you are very hyper aware of the wind of everything in your surroundings animals know that when they, the body language, almost all animals communicate through body language. Yes, they do. Some of them do through audio means, um, but audible means, but uh, body language is the biggest thing for most animals. So when they, when they look at you, walk around the corner and you're walking in a way that is confident, upright, and very aware of your surroundings, energetically, they pick up on that and they understand that and respect that. Now, let's paint the other picture. You're a jogger that really doesn't have that um, that viewpoint of the landscape. You're pretty much narrowed in on the trail ahead of you. You've got earphones in, so you're not hearing the bird sounds, the wind in the trees. You're not hearing. You, <laughs> you have no engagement with your your surroundings. You're purely running on a, on a trail. And then the animal, like predator, like a mountain lion, looks at you and sees your body language. Obviously, it's looking at two different states of being and of course the one is going to give more of a predatory initiate more of a predatory response whereas the other is not it's going to give off hesitancy so i think that plays a lot of the a lot of part so you've just been getting a, a whole you, he was walking all over you <laughs> yeah this is this is monkey the goat and uh she really likes to try to lay in my lap even though she's big now she's Real, yeah, she doesn't realize how big she is, but she was trying to lay in my lap. So, Kelly, uh, obviously you take care of the goats a lot, but the the goats take care of you too, right? They they feed yeah. you. But tell us tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. They 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 feed me. They right now we're getting the girls are probably making four gallons of milk a day. Um, so it's <laughs> a significant wow, amount of yeah. milk I'm drinking every day. Um, and I'm drinking probably a gallon a day and then wow. eating, eating goat cheese with if any, any food I'm eating, that's not milk, there's goat cheese on it. And, nice. uh, yeah, so they, they're making a big part of the diet and, How um, do you make the cheese? Well, there's a bunch of different ways, but, um, the, I'm just doing a really simple, uh, I'll either do, um, a clabbered cheese where you actually let the milk sour and then make cheese or i'll do a simple paneer which um just is adding it's using heat and vinegar or heat and acid basically so and i'm using vinegar um you just heat up the milk a bit and then add vinegar and it separates the curds from the whey and then just strain it off and there's fresh cheese it's like a pretty quick quick process oh that's wow. it's a fresh cheese but then aged cheeses are very fun but a little um more tricky for the nomadic life yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're not eating, you're not slaughtering and eating any of the goats, right? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, I will sometimes these, I used to, um, kill the goats and eat them, you know, eat them for meat more often. That was more part of the, just the flow of things. But I, these guys, I just have so much training in them and they're so socialized and so well trained there. If I do it, it, I feel like they're, better going to somebody who wants to start a milk or um, a pack goat herd they're sort of more valuable i guess and so i've been lately i've been you know if i'm trying to downsize instead of eating them 
I, you know, sell them or trade them to friends who are wanting, cause they have really good genetics. So it's yeah. like, they're kind of, you know, too valuable to eat, I guess, um, in that regard. But I will, you know, especially if, if the, whatever, um, the circumstances make sense to. And, but lately I've, my meat has been coming from lots of roadkill deer. And then, um, we're about to harvest some sheep soon. A friend is, has, um, we're getting some sheep from them and we'll harvest those guys for the meat. I know that um, we've talked about this several times, but uh, one of your one of the very important things for you in life is maintaining a connection with your food. And I just couldn't, I can't think of in, in this modern day world how many ways that you can do that on a consistent basis, which I think the way you're doing it is almost ideal i mean you're you're basically morphing the best of both worlds you're morphing the best of having livestock and having wild game from hunting because i mean your your livestock wild grazing them is as good as eating a a wild game animal that you've hunted i mean they're it's the same thing yeah yeah they're eating the same food they're (laughs) eating the same food and you're getting those wonderful nutrients through the cheese and the milk consistently. And then you also, like you said, roadkill. Uh, roadkill is such an amazing opportunity to take advantage of. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my friend Jamie, um, hmm. Jamie, who was on the, the intro to hunting calls, call, he, he sent me a message yesterday and he was saying how uh, he picked up a roadkill young, young buck. Like, t- like he, was, he couldn't have been more than like six or seven months old. And it was warm to the touch, and he was super excited for the opportunity to process the meat and just have that that good quality meat. And um, the uh, that meat is phenomenal, and it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, you know to take advantage of. And so, would you say that you you get most of your protein in your diet from roadkill or hunted animals, um, or from the goats? Yeah, the well protein. I'd say probably the most from the goats because of the milk. That's like my every day. I'm just having so much dairy is <laughs> I'm consuming so much dairy. It's ridiculous. But as far as meat, I um, do like to eat meat most days. And that is mostly uh, deer. Yeah, it's mostly yeah. deer. Um, we have been eating a deer that has um, been hunted, hunted deer, but mostly it's roadkill. And I love, you know, as you know, Joel, I mean, I'll, I'll kill animals if that's what, you know, I got to do, you know, but I prefer, I just, I love roadkill so much because I love eating. What's that? You're the ultimate scavenger. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And I just, I love me. I love processing animals, but I don't like killing. And I don't think anybody likes killing, but I think some, you know, people are more oriented towards hunting and I do, I love hunting also but there's just i I, like whether i'm cutting the throat of an animal or like letting an arrow fly there's just i I just have such a hard time actually taking the life but man roadkill i'm so happy because that you know the the decision's already been made and i guess that's kind of the thing too it's like the 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 decisions made the animals on the side of the road and it's i'm the cleanup crew and i'm very happy about being the cleanup crew (laughs) yeah i i think it's wonderful ali wonderful and um Please, listeners, if you if this is something that you have available in your state, because not every state allows you just to pick up roadkill, but a lot of states do. So look into, call your local fish and game office and just find out. And if it's legal, then look out for that that deer. I mean, especially when we get into the fall, close to the rut and the deer are running all over the show, um, there's usually a lot of roadkill that time. And take advantage of, you know, a good... 60 to maybe 90 pounds of of meat that you can take off and the thing too that's cool about it is i'm sure that like so when you're out hunting back country you tend to leave the bones and things like that which add more weight but if it's roadkill side of the road i just chuck the whole thing in the back of the truck and i've got now got bones to make bone broth um you know you can harvest the sinew you can tan the hide you could do all sorts of things that- speaking of tanning <clears throat> hides we're going to get to that we will, but, um, but yeah, that, that is it. such a great way for folks that want to get that wild meat that has no hormones or been messed with, you yeah. know, by food production companies, um, in 
to be able to have like all of it and not have to worry about going through the learning curve of hunting. I mean, what a great way yeah. for those that don't want to put the, the killing in their hands um, to, I know here in Texas, you can get um, your local, your, like whatever game warden is in your county, you can get a hold of him. And a lot of times if they have a very fresh killed um, roadkill deer that gets reported, um, he has a list of folks that he can call that people will will gladly come pick that deer up. Um, so, but definitely, oh, no. yeah, definitely. Wow. But check your regulations because in Texas, you're not allowed to just, if you see a deer get hit, the car in front of you hits a deer you're not allowed to just stop and pick that deer up and take it you do have to get a depredation tag or or a uh whatever it's it's a certain tag so just make sure you guys are are paying attention to um whatever the rules are but i'm sure nobody's gonna tell you that you can't have it you just have to go through the process yeah right and in montana you have to get a permit um but it's you know easy to you can get it online and so different states yeah some some states it's illegal and states that it is legal there's usually some process but it's worth it to go through that process to do it legally and it's also good to like you were saying cole it's good to just understand what the regulations are and in certain states there's chronic wasting disease which is a really you know big issue and i know everyone is trying to like um, reduce the spreading. And if you are picking up a roadkill and take it, you know, if you're picking up and taking it a mile away to where you live, um, you know, that probably isn't a big deal. But if you're, if you're transporting an animal, you know, a hundred miles or for, you know, a far distance, you got to worry about kind of spreading disease too. So it's good to also know what like diseases are in your area and if chronic wasting's in your zone and not, you know, not spread chronic wasting. So, which is in found in the brain and the spinal cord tissue. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Really yeah. Good point. Anytime that we um, go mm-hmm. hunt out of state, um, the carcass has to be completely, you know, taken care of before you leave the state. And then a lot of states now are requiring you, if you're going to take your head back, if you were to kill a bull or a buck, you actually have to boil your head before you um, cross state line. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Sting. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, wow. that makes sense because it's it, it you know the prions um yeah are, that carry the chronic wasting are in the the brain you know yeah, so we, that makes sense. Yeah. We've got it bad down here in the south south southwest. It's it's kind of it comes and goes. It's weird because um it's like sometimes there's deer that are tested and then that's the only deer in the county that's ever been found and it's like how does that really even happen? Um, when a lot of this stuff is spread by saliva, whenever they come in contact with each other's noses. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about the hide uh, tanning. You, Callie, well, you. I tell you what, I, I want to get into the hide tanning, but there's one more question to have, Callie. Okay. The goats. Okay. Final question on the goats. You've, um, the goats have been, you, you've been their caretaker, but, and they fed you, but also like, um, there's also that element of teachings that every animal gives us as human beings. What have you, what are the biggest learning or biggest takeaway experiences that you've, the, the goats have taught you? Oh, that's such a good question, Joel. Um, yeah, they, they have been huge teachers for me and I've ha- you know, a lot of my adult life I've had goats, I've had this herd for over four years. And then before this herd, I had another herd for over four years. So, you know, almost what nine, nine, getting close to 10 years of my adult life being a goat, um, you know, goat, um, caretaker Here, yeah. and, and in the times I didn't have my own herd, I was working with other people that had animals a lot of the time too. So it's been a pretty significant, you know, part of my life. And so I've learned so many things from them. You know, when I, in the first herd, I, I learned a lot about tracking from following them all the time, you know, and just, and being able to watch them and watch how their, you know, tracks go on the ground and just being able to actually be witnessing it every day and seeing all this stuff and being like, and even like just silly, like little things, you know, we're always trying to, um, age like deer scat and I am like pretty good at it because the goats, I know exactly, you know, okay. I watch a, you know, poop. And then an hour later, what does it look like? Three hours later, you know, and seeing kind of the aging of scat and all kinds of stuff. Cause I'm like, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) you know, and, um, but you know, the biggest thing, I think that they've been a teacher for me 
is just presence. They're not all, they're not all wound up about, um, they're not really all wound up about anything. They just are, they mm-hmm. just are either here, you know, they're just here and they're experiencing life and they're, they're like, cool, we got some stuff to eat. We're going to eat it. Now we're going to lay down. We're going to chew our cud it's all good. We're not trying to stress out about all this stuff. And I think watching their interpersonal dynamics are really funny because they'll like smash heads and they'll be like, Hey, you know, don't, don't come lay down by me. This is my spot. And they like fight over a spot and they like smash heads, you know, and like, they're like, you know, kind of rampaging, like, and then fighting. And then they'll just like lay down and like snuggle each other. You know, it's like very, everything's just like right on the surface for them. They're not like, I don't know. And I think it's just this beautiful thing because as humans, I feel like we have all these like layers of all this stuff we're like trying to deal with all the time. And the goats, it's just like right out there. They're like, yeah, you know, let's like butt heads. Okay, now let's cuddle. Okay, now let's eat. Now let's like just lay in the sun and enjoy. And they're just living life in, I feel like just fully present in the moment. And I, it's, it's a beautiful thing and a beautiful lesson and a beautiful reminder to just be like, oh, I don't really have to be freaking out about too much i can just enjoy the feeling of the sun on 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 me you know (laughs) yeah that's fantastic um and i imagine that spending that much time with them it can't help but rub off on you to slow down and be in the present yeah yeah that's awesome can can you one one more deal can you ever get a uh goat to swim will they swim like will they get in the water and get submerged Ah. they will swim so by nature goats do not like water they they won't even they don't even want to stand in an inch of water if they can avoid it they will step they'll do whatever they can to avoid getting their feet wet at all they don't like it but it with training they will go in water and they will swim these guys will swim um And in fact, since they have had a lot of water training, like we were cross, we were crossing some pretty big rivers that were flooded or flooding. Anyway, they were bigger than normal and they, they, they'll swim, um, which is like pretty cool. And now since they're really used to water, the other day we were eating and they were eating and there's, they wanted to get at some willows, but the only way to go eat the willows was to be standing in water and without water training goats, there's just no way they would go stand in the water, but they'll just, they're just standing in the water, eating the willows. I was like, good job. Good job. You guys, you don't yeah. need to be so afraid of the water. Yeah. That's oh, why, I, that's God. why I asked. I was curious because, uh, typically goats don't like to, to get into water. Yeah. Uh. They do not you know. <laughs> they don't like it at all. I think it's just for, they're from the mountains, you know, and they probably know they, it's good for them to keep their feet dry because they can get hoof rot and stuff. So it's probably uh, something to do with that. But yeah. um, with training, they will swim across rivers. And that's where it comes really in handy if you have pack goats to be really connected to them. Um, because if they don't trust you and they don't, they're not like loyal. They're going to be like, ha, ha, ha. you think we're going to follow you across that river? Yeah. yeah, right. You know, they won't do it. But these guys, they're like, well, mom's going across. I guess we ha- we don't have any choice, really. So they'll follow me. They'll follow me through some crazy stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Kelly, you have um, a course coming up. Um, and I think you should tell people about it. And then we want a simple little breakdown of how folks might be able to maybe pick up uh, some roadkill and then uh, maybe tan their own hide off of that animal. Um, so, yeah, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that and uh, break it down for us. Yeah, I would be happy to. So, yeah, I do have a class coming up um, pretty quick here where um going to be harvesting we're working with Icelandic sheep for the class and so we're going to be harvesting an Icelandic sheep and then everyone will be tanning their own um there's their their everyone will get their their own hide to tan so everyone will leave with an Icelandic sheep hide which will be a a really cool class it's going to be really deep just like your guys's hunting classes when you're working with life and death it's a it's you get to know each other really well so it's going to be a great class um and yeah. So, and for sheep, you know, there's so many different ways to tan skins. There's a bunch of different methods 
And, you know, there's a bunch of different considerations too of, you know, mainly do you want to leave the hair on or hair off on a sheep hide? We're definitely leaving the wool on because it, it's beautiful to have all that, those nice woolly locks. Mm -hmm. But for a roadkill deer, maybe you will leave the hair on, but more often um, with deer, people tend to take the hair off and create um, what would be known as a buckskin, a brain tan buckskin. And I do have... So many people have, were, especially even friends or people that were in classes who were like, Kelly, I found a roadkill, you know, what do I do? So I did make a um, two YouTube videos that are there, they could, that could be helpful for this conversation. One is um, what I, I have a whole video. I picked up a roadkill and just filmed it and like kind of what to do and what to consider a roadkill oh, deer. Excellent. Yeah. What's the name of your YouTube channel? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's, I, <laughs> I need, I haven't put anything on it in a while. I think, um, I mean, I think if you YouTube Callie Russell, it'll come up, but it's probably under Capricorn, the name that I run everything under Capricorn. Um, yeah. we'll, so anyway, we'll just, just it. YouTube Callie Russell. It'll, yeah, we'll find yeah, it. But and, Joel, uh, Joel will find it and put a link uh, down in the description. I'll, I'll find it. Put a, Joel I'll, will find it. I'll get a link to it. But, yeah, yeah the, I think yeah. the YouTube video for, for learning how to tan a hide is probably the best bet. I mean, obviously, I, I think nothing's better than having that in-person training. But just to open up people's awareness, it would be great to talk about, you know, the process kind of from A to Z, how you go about doing it. Yes, yeah. So I'm going to do that right now. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, yeah. Uh, cause it's kind of useful, but I do think there's so many books. Well, there's online articles, there's books, there's online classes, but being in person for tanning a hide or even just, it, you know, you got to get your hands on it cause it's a tactile skill, you know, and you can, you know, follow along with a book or something and, and go through the process, but it's pretty cool to take a class because you can be like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to feel just like this, you know? Yeah. And, and it's so much of, it's a very tactile experience. So if you find a roadkill deer and you, you know, you skin the hide and just the skinning is kind of an important part because if you use your knife, um, and you're using your knife the whole time, you might be putting a lot of holes in the hide, or even you think you might not be putting holes, but you're actually putting score marks in the hide that don't look like much. But once you're actually working the hide, they will turn in, they'll pop open and turn into holes. So ideally, um, you want to be, if you are using your knife, you want to be really careful, um, to not put any holes or score marks, but if you can, especially a warm animal, you can use the knife just to do the initial cuts and then use your hands, you know, your hands and elbows. And you guys, you know, you guys yeah. know, but yeah, uh, <laughs> like your fingers kind of in between that sort of, uh, uh, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but like the outer and inner dermis layer, yes. and then just sort of like, like push and then pull and just sort of separate it. Yeah. Right. And that is going to leave you with a skin that's going to be primo to tan because there's not going to be any knife marks or nicks or anything. So that's, um, you know, so it's really great if, you know, someone I know when I first started to learn to tan hides, I was getting hides from um, hunters and a lot of them are super knifed up. Um, so if you can, you know, if you can find a roadkill and skin an animal, then it's, it's really cool because you can be part of that process too. But regardless, if you skin it or if somebody gives you a hide or you find one or however you come across one, um, um, then there's, then you, there's, yeah, there's many paths. I'm just going to talk quickly about the, like the brain tanning. And so first you would if it's fresh, you can actually just go ahead and scrape the hair and the, um, the dermis layer off the, it, people also call it the grain layer with a dull, um, like a dull draw knife, something mm -hmm. dull though. You don't want it to be sharp because again, you'll rip up the hide, but, uh, something dull. Like I've used the, in a pinch, use the back of a machete. You know, I just duct tape one. So I have a handle on both sides, duct tape the tip and use the back of a machete. Um, and you scrape the hair, but a dull draw knife works good too. You scrape the hair and you scrape that grain layer off. And then if for hides that aren't fresh, 
um, or even if they are, some people um, put them in a, a lye solution first before yeah. doing that scraping. And a lot of you can make an ash solution with um, wood ash and you soak the hide and lye for about 12 hours. And again, th- this is one recipe. There's so many recipes yeah. and so many different things you can use. But, uh, you know, we, I don't want to be talking about it for hours on, the, on yeah. here. But, yeah. Yeah. But for the, yeah, for the brain tan method, you soak in lye or soak in ash and then scrape the hair and grain off. Um, like I said, sometimes if it's a fresh, if super fresh skin, I won't put it in the, in the lye. Um, but either way, there's pros and cons to both. And anyway, you can scrape, scrape the hair, scrape the grain, and then you have this beautiful skin without any hair and without that grain layer. And then you um, put it in your fat solution, which brains is a great option and, you know, used all over the world for millennia. Brains have been a, a prime fat, but you can also use egg yolks um, uh, and you can even use um, uh, pat- particular kinds of soap. But you want a, um, a fat solution and you soak the hides in there for, you know, 20 minutes or so and then you wring them. And you're, when you're wringing them, you're pushing those fats through the hide and like forcing those fats through the, the fiber structure of the hide. And then you go and then you, it's all tight. The hide's all tight from wringing it. And then you break it back open with your hands. You might have like a, um, some tools, like a breaking beam to kind of open it back up. And then you go back in the brains and you let it soak in there 20 minutes or something until it's like all nice, open and sloppy. Then you wring it again break it open again, back in the brains, ring it again, break it open again. And depending on how big the hide is, you know, a deer, three brainings is good, probably good. But if you're doing an elk, like a big thick elk, you probably want more brainings. Um, you might even add a little bit more fat, you know, to make sure it gets enough fat. And then once your hide has enough fat penetration basically um then you're ready for the softening stage which you can do either by hand or put the hide into a frame um which people you know have probably seen those like pictures of a hide kind of like tied up in a in a wooden frame and then you're um you know if it's in the frame then you're using a stick um that's uh, you know, come to a point, but blunted to kind of open everything up. You can use different tools. Um, you know, you can use all kinds of fun tools, even like a, a jawbone, like a, a mandible jawbone you can yeah. use. Um, and, it, and, uh, by hand, you're just kind of stretching and opening it, maybe running it over a breaking beam. And so basically that goal and the softening, you're keeping everything open and stretched open the whole time that hide is drying. So that might be all day long in a a wetter climate. Um, So ideally you're doing this softening stage on a dry day that, you know, it's a nice sunny dry day. But if you don't have those conditions, you can be do it by a a fire, you know, to help the drying process because you're basically going to do that until the hide is dry. Keep it open. that's the thing that's clear that needs to be clear, right? Is that you're when you when you're putting the, the hide on the rack, it's wet. Right. It's yes, wet. it's wet. And here's something I wanted to ask you. Is, uh, well, can we? Can I back up a little bit, if you don't mind? I have some yes. Of, the um, yeah. yeah, This so, is the quick and dirty description. So yes. Quick and dirty. <laughs> but, and yeah. I'll, I'll, but, I'll dig out the finer details here. The, yeah. So with the brains, um, you know, I I've never brain tanned, but I've always uh-huh. been told that every animal has the the brain is big enough for its hide. But now I, I'm pretty sure you told me that's not true a lot of the time, right? One brain is not enough. You sometimes need more or is it? Usually- right. That's what I have found in my experience. If And it also, you know, I've, I've heard that a lot. People always say that. And, you know, I think to get a hide somewhat, t- you know, like partially tanned, like tanned enough, you know, like. Hadza style, you know, yeah, yeah, or, or, you know, yeah. yeah, they're just, they just start wearing it, you know, yeah. but if, if you just, yeah. 
if you're just trying to get something uh, soft enough, you know, one the brain from their hot from their body is enough for that. But okay. if you want it really nice, you want it really soft and really nice. I find, you know, at least double that. So, you yeah. know, a, a deer hide, it would be nice to have two brains, you know, for a deer hide. But that's that's because I want it to be supple and soft and just really nice, you know. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So, so with the but brain, I have, you're obviously, you're breaking or, or probably... I mean, most people, my guess is they're probably sawing with like some sort of a power tool, the, the the skull open, extracting the brain. And are you putting the brain in a warm, like warm water and then and then basically pulverizing it, right? So that it, all, it kind of dilutes in amongst the water into like a soup. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. And again, if you're in chronic wasting territory, you might want to, you know, it's good to know that that's definitely been affecting brain tanners, the chronic wasting disease. Um, but yeah, you can use, uh, just a hand, you know, whatever saw a little, um, hacksaw or a sawzall or, uh, or just the, the back of a hatchet and just, you know, pop, yeah. just break in. Um, yeah. or you can even actually through the Farina Magnum, the hole in the back of the skull, you can even um, just scoop them out like that. If you're wanting to keep the skull like intact for a mount or something, yeah. or you can with like a pressure um, with like a hose, something like with pressurized, you can squirt up through the Farina Magnum and like squirt the brains out too. If you're trying to not break the skull open. Yeah. The, gotcha. the way gotcha. we do yeah. it, the way we do it to travel with it is take like a piece of wire with a loop on it and you're almost scrambling their brain so that you can dump it out that hole basically. And dump then you can, yeah, yeah, then you can rinse it out. out. Yeah. It's actually that's, pretty, yeah. it comes out pretty easy. Yeah. 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 That's great. And then, yeah, you're adding the brains to like a warm, yeah, warm water. You don't want it um, hot, too hot because you don't want to cook the hide. Um, so if it's too hot for your hand, it's too hot for your hide, you know, cause it's skin. So, you, but warm is really warm is ideal. Um, and then, yeah, you want to like be pulverizing, pulverizing that brain and you have this like, yeah, nice soupy mash kind of stuff. And I have done that experiment with the, with a goat, one of a goat that I raised, I was like, I really want to see if this is true. And so the brain of the brain of that goat, um, I used to tan the hide and it was, you know, technically tan, but it just wasn't very, it was like kind of, kind of mm -hmm. crispy, you know, it wasn't super Somewhere soft. Between like raw hide and fully tanned. So it's sort of yeah. like crinkled to it still. Yeah. Part, part tan, oh, partially yeah. tanned. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm not really interested in talking too much about the synthetic synthetic tanning solutions because everyone can go and just look for that stuff online. But what I am interested to know is what is your, your, um, uh, take on the pros and cons between brain tanning and bark tanning? Well, I like both. I do both. I bark tan and break t brain tan. And I also combine and I'll use um, fat. Oh. I'll use brains and bark on one hide. And I really like the combination too. And it just depends, you know, there's leather and animal skins are used for all kinds of stuff. And if I'm going to make a a summer t-shirt or a summer dress, or I'm going to make winter boots. I'm going to use different, not only different kind of skins, but also different, um, tanning methods too. So there's certain tanning methods that are more conducive for certain uses. So I, I like both. I use both. Um, and so, and, and bark tanning, you can use, you can bark tan a hide, um, with, you can with the grain on or off, which would be if you imagine suede versus leather. Leather has that um, um, slick, slick part of it on the top. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the and, the bark tanning, obviously, it's the the tannic acid content in the bark, and not all um, trees have. Well, some trees will have higher contents of tannic acid than others. So, what are you, in in your neck of the woods? What would you say would be the most uh, choice choice types of bark that you would use? Well, um, yeah, oak is really nice, but there's not really oak around here. Um, but there, Doug fir, uh, Doug oh. fir actually has enough uh, tannins in it. I've tanned lots of hides with Doug fir bark, and okay. um, yeah, willow too. Willow has tannic acid, so a, a lot of you're using the inner bark, right? It's not the outer bark. 
or is it just a mixture well, of both? It's the it's um basically I mean I don't go through the uh I can't think of the word the painstaking process of separating yeah. the inner and outer bark. Yeah. I'll just um put it all all in there the inner and the outer bark of like the Doug fir for example. And how do you what are the ratios like the dilution ratios like from bark to water versus brain to water? Well, bark tanning uses a lot more water because you're ma- basically making a tea from yeah. the the tan- the you know the bark solution. You're making a nice nice thick tea, strong tea to put the 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 skins in. And then brain tanning, you're only putting enough water to be able to get the brains, you know, enough so the hide can go into that solution. Okay. Uh, so you're, you don't want to have too much water with the brains because then you're kind of watering down everything. So Makes Gotcha. Sense. Okay. So you're mm-hmm. just adding enough water so that there's enough liquidity to soak the hide with brains. But with bark, Tanny, I'm sure you're just basically going by color, right? You're looking for that dark, red, dark brownish color, the th- you know, deep dark color that's indicating that there's a high tannic acid content. Yes, that's right. And so that's generally you know, what I've been doing here and how I learned, but there are so many different ways. And, um, I like, it's, it's kind of actually mind blowing, you know, you start learning, you're like, yeah, these are like the three ways to tan hides, (laughs) but actually, especially all over the world and through all over time, people have come up with all kinds of crazy ways to tan hides. And some of it's really almost even like the opposite of what I've learned, how I was taught to do it. And I was just in um, Finland in October for a high tanning, uh, actually an international high tanning seminar and a high tanning workshop. And I got to learn some traditional Scandinavian methods of tanning hides. Oh, cool. And they, yeah, they're doing, you know, you can do stuff different and they actually use the bark solution in a, they use it different ways, but they'll like paint it on the skin. Huh. They'll like paint it on instead of like put the hide into a big pot with the bark sol- solution, you know? So, and you know, people and I, you know, how I learned is I put, you know, put um, the hide in the solution of brains. So it's like in the soup, but there's also a lot of traditions that are just like smearing the brains on the hide and then like rolling it up, you know? Um, and, you know, so there's so many different methods. Hmm. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. We're just mm-hmm. to summarize up for the listeners, especially the listeners that have never heard of tanning a hide. I mean, let's let's let me just back way up for a second. For those that are maybe a little lost, we're talking about taking an animal skin and making it into clothing. <laughs> so yeah. if, yes. Hold on that by now, then I apologize, but that's what we're ultimately doing. And Kelly is an expert in this. That's why we're questioning her on this. So we to keep this really in a nutshell, we're basically you've talked to get your skin remove the all the flesh and fat and if you want the hair um, from the skin to we have the, just a bare skin then take the brain or the bark we've talked about this tanning solution we want to soak it in well first of all you wanted to soak it in some lye right so you want to soak it in some lye to prep it then you're going to soak it in the tanning solution and the combination of soaking it in the tanning solution and then wringing it is really all you're trying to do is trying to get every single fiber in there exposed to that solution correct that's the ultimate goal right and that with uh putting the hide in the lye and then that's more of the uh, brain tanning method with the bark tanning you usually don't do that uh, but typically i haven't seen that um maybe someone does i don't like i said there's so many different ways but um but yeah typically so for brain tanning or yet, yeah, like you said, take all the fat and muscles and meat and hair and the grain layer off and then put it in lye and then put it in fat and you're wringing and forcing those fats through the fiber structure of the hide. And once you've got enough fat by doing repeating the wringing process, you know, several times, probably three times then you're softening and that is um you're basically working the hide and keeping it open the whole time it's drying and those fats are like lubricating all of those fibers in there so while it's wet and why it has like the fat solution on it you're working it open and keeping all those fibers open while it's drying and then when it's dried 
it the hide is opened, the fiber structure is opened, um, yeah. and because those fats help those fibers to stay open. Because if you didn't do the tanning process, you just skinned a hide and then laid it, put it on a you know a tree branch and let it dry. It would dry very hard, and it would be kind of like the treats that people feed their dogs. You know, like yeah. this like hard piece of stuff, and that's what a skin is like if you don't tan it. So the goal is we're adding those fats. Or if you go down the bark method, you're adding tannins and then you're stretching that hide and keeping it open to keep it soft. And, and if you succeed, then when it's dry, it's really nice and soft. And then for the, you know, if you're brain tanning, the final step is uh, smoking the hide where you basically, there's a, again, many ways, but you can sew it uh, in half and create like a pillowcase with, with the skin and then put it over uh, smoke, not flame, smoke, yeah, and get, yeah. yeah, and get uh, the smoke into the hide, and then that is um, basically, um, you know, saving your work. So you have, then if then if the hide gets wet, it will still remember um, and and be soft, even if it, um, and, so it won't go back to being raw hide when it gets wet, basically. Yeah, and it doesn't it also help preserve the skin from sort of decaying yes ex yeah well the whole process does preserve the hide from decaying but the smoke is extra nice um for you know preserving the hide and also keeping bugs and stuff off of it i've noticed it seems like bugs and stuff don't really love um the smoky smell so it just protects it and like bacteria you know bacteria doesn't like smoke and all that so it's really good for preserving Oh man, I can't wait to do this with you one day, Kelly, because this is like, you know, in, in full transparency, this is one skill that I've really wanted to delve into. And I've, I have tanned a couple uh, deer hides with egg yolk and it, they were okay, but I, I, I fully appreciated how tanning is one of those skills that you, you just, you just, it's not quite a youtube watch youtube video and do it it's you really want to do it with someone who can teach you hands-on and so I, I look forward to that at some point i Same. look forward to it too joel it'll be <laughs> it'll be so fun yeah we're gonna have to man maybe we are gonna have to chat and get a get a hide tanning course put together yeah oh yeah, you know maybe we can even combo it with your guys's hunting course like do two two for one kind of thing now we're talking. It, yeah. Yeah. Like have sweet. add a couple, add a couple days on to the hunting course yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to talk about that. So <laughs> I, I have, um, just a question when, when, uh, so putting, um, the, the, the hide on the rack, how, uh, how are you making the holes in the hide when you, when you, when you run the rope through to tie it up to the rack? Because, I've noticed that I've made some holes in the past and a couple of them tear through. So first of all, is there a trick to making those holes so they don't tear through or is it just a matter of tension? Like you just don't want to over tension it. Well, both. Yes and both. <laughs> <laughs> so you, well, there's a few things, you know, if the hide is just a very thin hide, it might just be a better candidate for hand softening and not putting it in the frame. But if it's, you know, a medium to large size deer hide, they can stand up to being put in the frame. And, um, you, I usually poke the holes into the hide with a knife. And the thing is, is you want the hole to be uh, parallel with the edge of the, with the, the edge of the skin. So you don't want it being uh horizontal because then the the end of the hole with the knife is where you're pulling the tension right on that weak point so if the hole like the knife cut yeah a knife punch is parallel with the skin then it's pulling on like the side of that hole versus the point of the hole does that okay. make sense yep yeah so so you make the cut parallel to the with the edge of the skin yeah right yes yeah exactly okay. Exactly. And then where you, um, you know, place the holes, you know, make sure you have enough holes like in the thicker part of the hide too. Um, okay. In the thicker, yeah. In the thicker part. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, that's, have we, have we lost you? No. no. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It still sounds great. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's cool. I just, 
had to plug in a, I knew this might happen. So I brought a, a battery, a battery oh, pack okay. and just plugged <laughs> it in. So. Well, we, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you another 10 minutes or so. We're not going to go too much longer. We want to respect yeah, you. Yeah, but we're, um, we're plugged into the battery now. Um, uh, there was uh, something else I just sort of wanted to mention too for the listeners because we did sort of touch on it is raw hide. So obviously the goal with tanning is to soften the hide for like, you know, clothing, um, certain t- like a, what do you call it? Like moccas- type of moccasin or a, a mucklock or gloves or something like that. But um, rawhide is a also very fantastic tool. And I've, I've, I've really liked the use of rawhide um, because of its strength for things like knife sheaths, um, slippers, sandals, shoes, that type of thing. Of course, uh, rawhide dries really hard in, an, in a desert type environment. It's fantastic. But if you're going to go into a very wet environment, that rawhide is just going to become all slippery and, and rehydrate and become a little miserable. But in dry climates, it can be it can be really cool. And, and yeah, like bags, there's all sorts of things that you can make with rawhide. Um, you know, traditionally bowstrings were made out of sinew and rawhide. So, you know, rawhide has its has its uses too um, and definitely much easier to uh, to work with. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Raw, yeah, rawhide's an a, amazing, just amazing. You can even, you know, cut thin strips and then you have basically cordage, you know, rawhide cordage or rawhide ties and you can tie it you know say if you're building a shelter or something you can yep. tie the rawhide on there wet and then when it dries it's super tight yeah um, that's again the, better yeah, that's for dry cool environments cool thing about yeah better for dry environments yeah it's a cool it's cool how i mean the first time that i ever did it i was just it just enamored with how you can take uh, i think wet forming would be probably the technical term you can take the raw hide try and stretch it out a little and then uh you know it's thoroughly soaked you can wrap it around a knife or you know for a knife sheath let's use that as an example you can wrap it around the shape of the knife leave it on there let it dry and then once it's dry it's rock hard and it it maintains the exact shape for your knife sheath so that's the cool thing about it but obviously if it gets wet again, it's losing that shape. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, that, right. <laughs> but that's, but, um, um, so that's one use though for a hide. We're talking about hides that aren't tan, you know, they're not super soft. They're kind of like partially, you know, tan. Yeah. That can be a nice, um, you know, purpose where you're kind of using the, the hide like raw hide and uh, form fitting it over your knife or whatever it is. Uh, to make a sheath but then since it is partially tanned it's not going to completely just go back to like being a wet noodle if you're in a rainstorm yes. yeah cool. yeah that's i've seen the huds that make the knife sheaths knife sheaths like mm-hmm. that um and then they also like you say they'll you know like uh, the typical way that a lot of it, the most effective way to make cordage out of the rawhide is if you cut the rawhide in sort of like a circle in a spiral. So you have sort of like a, you know, you cut from the outside, you follow a line and you just continue with that line on the inside and you basically spiral all the way to the middle. And then you get in, you end up with a whole bunch of, of a single strand, you know, whatever, like um quarter inch uh, width um, uh, rawhide. And then you can twist it into rope. You know, just twist it into whatever bowstring, whatever, whatever rope you want. Right. So. And we've got, we got to watch Mokma do that with that Pimby skin. Yes. Remember? Yes. He did it. Yeah. He did it with, um, well, was it, was it a dick dick, I think, right? Oh, wait. Was it a dick dick? No, no, no. You're right. We, the so, <laughs> so I've seen him do it with a dick dick skin, which is like a very small antelope, but he did it with a Pimby with the rock Kyrax. Yeah, yeah cause we were just really bugging him. We really wanted to watch um, how um, he made yeah, the yeah. strip. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Exactly. And that's what he did, right? Cut it into the strips, mm-hmm. soaked it in water overnight. And then the next day, he just twisted three of them together. Well, he mm-hmm. tied three of them together, tied it on a, on, a, on, a, on a piece of it, like a branch or something, pulled it at the other end, stretched it, twist, stretch it, twist, stretch it, twist, until it was twisted enough. Then he tied it off, all stretched out. And then once it dried it maintained that's that um braid yeah it's pretty cool yeah that's cool yeah <laughs> so what's uh what's next for you Callie? what's uh what's what's the plan for the rest of the summer and the fall and just a lot of teaching or 
Yeah, I got a few, you know, a few classes, um, the one I mentioned, and then also doing a couple um, wild women courses, which are really, uh, really fun, just kind of like all all women's all around. Um, we're covering like a bunch of ancestral skills within the week. And then I'm doing um, a pack basket class, which will probably be mostly returning wild women that have taken the wild woman class before they'll come back. And um, yeah, dude, we're going to be making pack baskets. And last summer I led a couple, I did some guiding um, with the goats in the mountains around here. And I don't have anything planned um, as far as like taking other people out on trips this summer. Um, Cause it's actually pretty hard to get the permits to do that. Uh, but I am going to be taking the goats out just, you know, for, you know, for, for fun, for personal fun, I guess, and taking them out on some pack trips, uh, this summer. Man, that sounds like fun. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad, I'm really glad you kicked up the, te- the teaching. I think it's, uh, a lot of people get the opportunity to spend some time with you. That's great. Yeah. that's. Awesome. It's so fun. It's so, it's just I mean, you guys know how it is having the in-person groups. It's just the best. I mean, it, it's like every course, it, it's like this, it's like a life-changing experience, you know? It's just a really cool, yeah. it's just so yeah. cool. Yeah, hey, Cole, the groups that we have, like every year, we're just like, damn, how do we how do we bring in these wonderful people? And they have such an impact on us. And yeah, it's Yeah, so- that's how I wonder too. I'm like, Wow. It's unbelievable to me whenever people leave our course and they're like, you've changed my life forever. And I came here to learn how to hunt. And really, it's been so much deeper, like, you know, just the conversations we end up having outside of the curriculum. Um, it's just, you yeah. know, yeah, it's, it's great. And uh, do you have any spots available, Callie, that you want people maybe to know about or um, how they can sign up for your courses? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, for these courses and any future stuff, my website, which is uh, capricorn.com, which everyone's like, what the heck is that? I just, a word I made up, it means goat queen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I just made it, capra is the species name for goat, right? And con is like, you know, the, like, you know, ruler, you know, so anyway, capricorn, that's goat cool. queen. That's- um, that's the C A P R A K H A N or yeah, that's right. C A P R A K H A N. Um, which I probably should have just went with Goat Queen because people can spell that easier. But <laughs> whatever, <laughs> can't can't make things too easy. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, that that's all the information's on there and stuff. And um, yeah, it is amazing the classes. It's like we get together and we think, oh yeah, we think we're going to be learning about hunting or canning hides or weaving baskets but actually it's so much more it's it's life you know we're like remembering what it means to be humans and have these deep conversations together and laugh around the fire and you know kind of connect with each other in these deep ways and it's it's just so it's so beautiful yeah yeah it's it's so interesting how that it's the reverse like people think that coming to a course like that it, you know with an instructor is the gateway to learning the skills but it's quite the opposite <laughs> learning the skills is the gateway to having meaningful conversation and connection <laughs> with others absolutely <laughs> yeah i love yeah. it it's crazy oh, man. i'm like Kelly, some, it is, somebody's yeah. paying me for me to have this uh you know just this experience and uh i'm getting more out of it probably than they are <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well i think if everything goes well everyone benefits in, yeah. in a different way but yeah Kelly, absolutely it's so, it's so good to catch up it's been it's been a while and um you know i care for you like a sister you know i really value all of the, the moments we've had together in fact i wanted to mention in the beginning i forgot to so i got to mention it now this the music i'm not is it oh that was that exact recording was the moment that you and I and Jeremy were sitting there that one night when Moses started to sing with, I forget the other guy's name, but they just started to sing that randomly. Do you remember that moment? Absolutely. I remember that moment. It, it's the highlight of my Hudza experience. There's no experience that tops that for me. That night when they randomly started to sing, it was just the two of them and us three sitting there and we all started singing together and shouting and screaming and 
it was such an incredible moment of connecting with those people that um, I, I'm just so grateful that we got to do it together. And that is the exact recording because I just hit record in my phone. There was nothing to look at, but I just it recorded the volume. Oh, it was, it was so good. Yeah, when I heard it at the beginning of the pod, I started dancing. And yeah. I was like, oh, it brought me, you know, right back. That moment was, it was like pure bliss, you know? It was, oh, it was so good. It was so, such, it was yeah. such a good moment. Well, yeah. Uh, I, well, uh, I, I'd love to I'm have you back here, on the future. I'm still here, my video messed I, up. If, if, Sorry, Joel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, we, just, we just see green. That's okay. Um, Kelly, we'd love to have you back in the future, but I really wish you a wonderful summer. Um, and, uh, we'll have to catch up at some point. There's uh, definitely some exciting, uh, plans for the Hudza. Um, I've got some private funding. We're going to be looking at putting in a well. We've actually got some land. So I just need to update you with all of that sort of stuff and, um, and, uh, trying to, you know, trying to, trying to do our part to help them when we can. So amazing i love it um yeah it's so fun to chat and we're gonna we'll be chatting more um and catching up for sure and just joel cole my brothers it's yeah. just so wonderful to chat with you guys and i love that you're doing this podcast too it's just it's really amazing well thank you well thank yeah, you for joining. thank you so it's, much uh, absolutely such great having you all right um, everybody yeah thank you guys so much we appreciate and love every one of y'all um go check out callie's courses you can also follow her little adventures on um on instagram as well and we'll link all that uh that stuff in the bottom if you guys haven't so thank you so much and we will see yeah. you guys next week make sure you go get out in the bush